Hello, everyone. I'm so sorry I couldn't be with you this week, but heat is not my friend. But I'm so happy that I could share this message with you. I will be the storyteller this week at Vacation Bible School, which is a new tradition they've made for me, so I won't be out of service. I thought about what I could say to you as a message, and I tried twice to give you a message, and they just didn't work. So I tried again, and I thought about words and what they mean. I was cleaning out my bookcases with the help of a young friend, and I came across a book that I had had for my children that talked about people with disabilities, but it was written in the 1980s, and it talked about handicaps, and I just looked at the book, and it was good except for the word handicap, and it just kept showing up again and again, and it meant well, but that word kept jumping out at me, and talked about wheelchair bound and, and it just wasn't right so I got rid of that book I might have to use a wheelchair and so might you but that doesn't bind me it sets me free to live my ha leave my house and go out into the world there might be places I can't go because there's no ramp but there are so many places I can go I can't go to the beach but I can go to the forest I can cross grass, and I can cross gravel, and I can cross dirt. This chair is a wonder for me. And then I looked up the word handicap because it kept bothering me so much. And the dictionary said it was a physical or mental disability, making participation in certain of the usual activities of daily living more difficult. Well, that's true, and that's not all that bad. Things are more difficult. And then I looked at another definition. It said, any disadvantage that makes success more difficult. Well, that's true. And again, that's not that awful. But you know what I don't hear in that definition? Things aren't impossible. Handicap is not that bad. Things are not impossible. I've been accused of being many things in my life, among them a Pollyanna. And personally, I take that as a compliment. For those of you who aren't familiar with Pollyanna, and I'm amazed people aren't familiar with her, she's a character created by Eleanor H. Porter in a book of the same name. Pollyanna was also a popular movie when I was growing up starring Haley Mills. If you haven't seen it, you really should. That girl will melt your heart. And it, for those of us in the ministry, you will love the pastor and his sermons. Death comes unexpectedly. I don't need to say anything else. Pollyanna has a sunny disposition and a positive outlook on life, and she plays something called the glad game, something that rubbed off on me. Whenever something bad happens to Pollyanna, she looks for the good in it. In the book, when her Aunt Polly puts her in a stuffy attic room without carpets or pictures, she takes joy from the beautiful view in her window. When Aunt Polly punishes her for being late to dinner by feeding her bread and milk and making her eat in the kitchen with the staff, she is delighted because she likes bread and milk and she loves the staff. I like the glad game because I didn't have that kind of childhood you saw on TV when I was growing up. I didn't have the kind of home you wanted to invite your friends over. But with the glad game, I could find something good to celebrate anyway. It's okay if my dad didn't love me because I had a father in heaven who did. And it was okay if I got sent to my room for something I didn't do because I was safe in my room and I could read to my heart's content. I was glad. As I entered my mid-twenties, I noticed problems with my body, starting with my knees and my respiratory system. I persevered, joking about my cheap Navy parts. I was born in a Navy hospital on Navy Day during the Korean War. As the surgery started and my mobility limitations began, I played the glad game. At least I'd been able to dance and play tennis and hike and bike when I was younger. At least I was still able to preach and to sing. When I entered an 18-month period of autoimmune disease which kept me confined to my house and I couldn't speak, the glad game became a bit harder. But I decided I was glad I could spend time with God since I couldn't really go anywhere else. It was time, my time to be still and to listen. Perhaps it was God's time to catch up with me. In time, I recovered from five knee surgeries, two hand surgeries, and the removal of my gallbladder all within five years. 
I learned to walk again. And finally, I thought I got rid of my wheelchair. I was very glad. I was a certified lay speaker, a youth leader, and I helped set up and run an Alzheimer's Daycare Resource Center. I was positive I was on the right road, doing what God wanted of me. So I started on the path to ordain ministry. Everything seemed so certain, and everything went so quickly, it fell into place so neatly. I'd spent several years lay speaking before I finally said yes to God, and I was filling not only the three local UMC pulpits, but also filling in at the local Presbyterian church. When I finally said yes, the home we'd been trying to sell in another state was purchased by a man who walked in and offered us cash, as is. No quibbling on the price. It was a miracle. I knew everything was in place. I declared my candidacy and was certified immediately. I was assigned a candidacy mentor who was just the right fit and, and we're still close friends. Oh, there were bumps along the way. Since I was working with the immigrant community in my hometown, the pastor of the church where I was worshiping insisted I do the exploratory work in Spanish and have it read by a high school Spanish teacher for a proficiency because she didn't read or write Spanish. I passed. So I was able to take my classes at the Hispanic Course of Study School before I went to licensing school. I understand that's backwards, but I told God I needed to understand at least 85% to continue on this crazy course, and God was good. I got B's in my first classes. I continued taking courses of study in Spanish, and in English when Spanish courses weren't available. I started my studies walking, and midway through I started using a wheelchair again. But despite missing classes due to surgery and illness, I managed to graduate in the normal five years, and I was immediately approved for provisional membership. I loved my work. By then I'd been appointed to a congregation, and I loved them and the people I helped with my other work. I had to pinch myself. I couldn't believe I was getting paid to do what I did. Sure, it was minimum salary on equitable compensation, but it was a salary to do something I loved. And then the axe fell. I was put on medical leave, or incapacity leave as they used to call it. I couldn't understand why this was happening to me. I had worked so hard getting good grades, helping the Pacific Island and Cambodian students at Claremont, moving from an 80-mile circuit of immigrant communities from Lone Pine to Crowley Lake to a permanent parish in Independence. On the side, I wrote a Spanish-language column for the local paper's religion page, hosted a bilingual program for the local cable access channel, facilitated a Spanish-language domestic violence program, enrolled families in Healthy Families low-cost insurance, and taught English as a second language. How could I now be set aside to do nothing? I just didn't understand. How could I play the glad game? What was there to celebrate? I have to admit, I gave in to sadness for a while. I gave in to my illness. I needed time to let my body rest. It just wasn't strong enough to do anything else. I started seeing a counselor, a Christian woman who, finished, who listened and helped me deal with my loss. But in time, she gave me something to be glad about. Every time, she said, that people see you going down the street, smiling, talking to people, just going about your life, you are encouraging other people. I've had people tell me that if you can smile and keep going, so can they. Wow. I was a role model. That was something. I thought about the people who had been my role models. Jill Kinmont, who had broken her neck qualifying for the Olympics and fought to finish college, get her teaching credential, and find a school district that would hire her. She lived in Taunton, my town, and was the first person to sign up when I started a mentoring program at our church. I learned a lot about graceful acceptance and navigating a 100-year-old church from her. And my friend Celeste had lived with MS for 30 years while raising a son on her own. Her vision was so impaired she couldn't use a power chair, and the use of her hands was so limited she couldn't propel herself. She taught me about pill containers and organizing my meds a week at a time. Lupita and Santiago sat me down and made me think about the reality that I might be living in a wheelchair one day. 
and they showed me how they arranged dishes, pots and pans and linens, and where they could easily reach them, how to find good parking spaces that would accommodate a ramp van, and how to take a shower with a shower stool. I was glad that God had brought these special friends into my life. And I was glad, but sad, that I could, was no longer able to go to annual conference because of the heat and the extreme schedule, because I was available somewhere else. My husband told me about a terrible accident in which a woman was killed when a truck ran into and over a motorcycle. The woman was the passenger on the cycle. Brad had to report the accident to Sacramento because it took place in a controlled traffic zone. The next day, I was at our local J.C. Penney store, passing time. I had no real reason to be there, except there were workmen at our house, and I needed to be out of the way. There was a man on a cell phone trying to give us a, a phone number to somebody on the other end who, who wasn't understanding. Our eyes met, and we smiled. After he got off the phone, he spoke to me. He told me he was in the store to get some new clothes because those he was wearing were covered with his wife's blood. She had died in an accident the day before. Yes, he was the driver of the motorcycle. He told me how the truck had been speeding in a construction zone, how he had held his wife in his, as she died in his arms, how he'd asked the truck, truck driver what he was doing speeding in a construction zone, and then he asked if I would pray for him. He had no idea who I was. But we held hands and I prayed. And a group of customers gathered around us. The circle of customers grew, and it was a holy moment. There was a great stillness around us. When I finished praying, there was a chorus of amens, and people came up to hug the man or pat his shoulder. I gave him my card in case he wanted to talk. When he went to the back of the store to look for something else, I paid for his pants and shirt and sock and told the clerk to tell him it was on the house. The man contacted me after he got home to let me know he was able to fly back to Utah with his wife's body and was getting counseling and getting on with his life. I was glad. I know that my path to ordained ministry stopped short of its goal, and that's okay. It's not for my glory, but for God's glory that I do my work. While the bishop's laying on of hands would have been a joy, it doesn't negate the work I do, nor does it increase its value. I rejoice that I'm called to love and to care. I can still use my voice, and I have a mighty chariot of sorts to convey me and to run over the toes of those who stand in my way. I still have a mind and a heart, and friends and colleagues who understand if my frailty doesn't allow me to work on a regular scale. I am blessed. Some of you might be in the same situation, feeling sidetracked or abandoned or frustrated or cut off. Don't be. I am convinced the road never ends. Like that great new car commercial that tells you your driveway connects you to every road in the country. We are always connected to God and to each other. I was reminded this morning of an opportunity we had some years ago to take a helicopter flight with our son. He is the superintendent of a helicopter firefighting base and for the Forest Service. And before the helicopter goes out of service for the winter, family members are sometimes allowed to go up for short rides. We took off from the floor of the Owens Valley and climbed up the peaks of the Sierra Nevadas, home of Mount Whitney, the highest point in the U.S. What caught my attention was that if we climbed up the slopes of the mountain, there was always something growing. Even at the very top, there was green matter growing between the cracks of the rocks. Life always wins. God always finds a way. And so do we. I believe that we, with special challenges, are that much stronger and that much more adaptable because we do find a way. I thank God for that. And for all of you who fight the good fight and work to make God's family truly inclusive. 
I leave you with these verses from Isaiah 41, 9 and 10. You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. May it always be so. Amen.